next day, the trumpets rang early in the camp. About midday, the banners of the forest and the lake were seen to be borne forth again. A company of twenty was approaching the dwarves' camp. At the beginning of the narrow way, they laid aside sword and spear and came on towards the gate. Wondering, the dwarves saw that among them were both Bard and the Elven King, before whom an old man wrapped in cloak and hood bore a strong casket of iron-bound wood. Hail, Thorin, said Bard. Are you still of the same mind? My mind does not change with the rising and setting of a few suns. Did you come to ask me idle questions? The elf host has not departed. Till then you come in vain to bargain with me. Is there nothing for which you would yield any of your gold? Nothing that you or your friends have to offer. What of the ark and stone of Thrain? At the same moment, the old man opened the casket and held aloft the jewel. The light leapt from his hand, bright and white in the morning. Then Thorin was stricken dumb with amazement and confusion. No one spoke for a long while. Thorin at length broke the silence. That stone was my father's and is mine, he said. Why should I purchase my own? But how came you by the heirloom of my house, if there is any need to ask such a question of thieves? We are not thieves, Bard answered. Your own we will give back in return for our own. How came you by it? shouted Thorin. I gave it to them, squeaked Bilbo. You, you, cried Thorin. You miserable hobbit. You undersized burglar. And he shook poor Bilbo like a rabbit. By the beard of Durin, I wish I had Gandalf here. Curse him for the choice of you. May his beard wither. As for you, I will throw you to the rocks. And he lifted Bilbo in his arms. Stay. Your wish is granted, said a voice. The old man with the casket threw aside his hood and cloak. Here is Gandalf. And none too soon, it seems. If you don't like my burglar, please don't damage him. Put him down and listen first to what he has to say. Never again will I have dealings with any wizard or his friends. What have you to say, you descendant of rats? Dear me, dear me, said Bobo, you may remember saying that I might choose my fourteenth share. The time was, all the same, when you seemed to think that I had been of some service. Take it that I have disposed of my share as I wished, and let it go at that. I will said Thorin grimly, and I will let you go at that, and may we never meet again. I am betrayed. It was rightly guessed that I could not forbear to redeem the Arkenstone, the treasure of my house. For it I will give one fourteenth share of the hoard in silver and gold, setting aside the gems, but that shall be accounted the promised share of this traitor. Get down now to your friends, he said to Bilbo or I will throw you down. What about the gold and silver? asked Bilbo. That shall follow after, as can be arranged, said Thorin. Get down. Until then we keep the stone, cried Bard. You are not making a very splendid figure as king under the mountain, said Gandalf. But things may change yet. And so Bilbo was swung down from the wall, and departed with nothing for all his trouble, except the armour which Thorin had given him already. More than one of the dwarves, in their hearts, felt shame and pity at his going. Farewell, he cried to them. May we meet again as friends. Be off. If you do not hasten, I will sting your miserable feet. So be swift. Not so hasty, said Bard. We will give you until tomorrow. At noon we will return and see if you have brought from the hoard the portion that is to be set against the stone. If that is done without deceit, then we will depart and the elf host will go back to the forest. In the meantime, farewell. The next day the wind shifted west and the air was dark and gloomy. 
The morning was still early when a cry was heard in the camp. Runners came in to report that Dane had come. He had hurried on through the night, and so had come upon them sooner than they had expected. Each of his folk was clad in a hauberk of steel mail that hung to his knees, and his legs were covered with hose of a fine and flexible metal mesh. The dwarves were exceedingly strong for their height, but most of these were strong even for dwarves. In battle they wielded heavy two-handed mattocks, and their faces were grim. Trumpets called men and elves to arms. Before long the dwarves could be seen coming up the valley at a great pace. Bard went out to meet them, and with him went Bilbo. We are sent from Dane, son of Nain, they said when questioned. We are hastening to our kinsmen in the mountain. But who are you that sit in the plain as foes before defended walls? Bard refused to allow the dwarves to go straight on to the mountain. He was determined to wait until the gold and silver had been brought out in exchange for the Arkenstone, for he did not believe that this would be done if once the fortress was manned with so large and warlike a company. They could stand a siege for weeks, and by that time yet more dwarves might come, and yet more, for Thorin had many relatives. These were, in fact, precisely their plans, but for the moment the way was barred. Bard then sent messengers at once to the gate, but they found no gold or payment. Arrows came forth, and they hastened back in dismay. In the camp all was now astir, as if for battle, for the dwarves of Dane were advancing. Fools, laughed Bard, to come thus beneath the mountain's arm. They do not understand war above ground, whatever they may know of battle in the mines. There are many of our archers and spearmen now hidden in the rocks upon their right flank, let us set on them now from both sides before they are fully rested. But the elven king said, Long will I tarry, ere I begin this war for gold. Let us hope still for something that will bring reconciliation. But he reckoned without the dwarves. The knowledge that the Arkenstone was in the hands of the besiegers burned in their thoughts. Suddenly, without a signal, they sprang forward to attack. Bows twanged and arrows whistled. Battle was about to be joined. Still more suddenly, a darkness came on with dreadful swiftness. Winter thunder and a wild wind rolled, roaring up and rumbled in the mountain. And beneath the thunder, another blackness could be seen whirling forward. But it did not come with the wind. It came from the north, like a vast cloud of birds, so dense that no light could be seen between their wings. Then, in a voice like the thunder itself, his staff blazing forth with a flash like the lightning, Gandalf cried out, Halt! Dread has come upon you all. The goblins are upon you, O Dane. Bald of the north, whose father you slew in Mariah, is coming. The bats above his army are like a sea of locusts. They ride upon wolves, and wolves are in their train. Come, there is time yet for counsel. Let Dane, son of Nain, come swiftly to us. So began the battle of the five armies, and it was very terrible. Upon one side were the goblins and the wild wolves, and upon the other were elves and men and dwarves. Ever since the fall of the great goblin of the Misty Mountains, the hatred of their race for the dwarves had been rekindled to fury. Not even the ravens knew of their coming until they came out of the broken lands which divided the lonely mountain from the hills behind. How much Gandalf knew cannot be said but it is plain that he had not expected this sudden assault. This is the plan he made in council with the elven king and with Bard and with Dane, for the goblins were the foes of all, and at their coming all other quarrels were forgotten. Their only hope was to lure the goblins into the valley between the arms of the mountain and themselves to man the great spurs that struck south and east. Yet this would be perilous if the goblins were in sufficient numbers to overrun the mountain itself and so attack them from behind and above. But there was no time to make any other plan or to summon any help. To the mountain, called Bard, to the mountain. Let us take our places while there is yet time. Ere long the vanguard swirled round the spur's end and came rushing into Dale. These were the swiftest wolf riders and already their cries and howls rent the air afar. As Gandalf had hoped, the goblin army had gathered behind the resisted vanguard and poured now in rage into the valley, driving wildly up between the arms of the mountain, seeking for the foe. It was a terrible battle. 
the most dreadful of all Bilbo's experiences, and the one which at the time he hated most, although he was quite unimportant in it. Actually, I may say, he put on his ring early in the business, and vanished from sight, if not from all danger. The elves were the first to charge. As soon as the host of their enemies was dense in the valley, they sent against it a shower of arrows. Behind the arrows, a thousand of their spearmen leapt down and charged. Just as the goblins were recovering from the onslaught, and the elf charge was halted, there rose from across the valley a deep-throated roar, with cries of Mariah and Dane, Dane, the dwarves of the Iron Hills plunged in, and beside them came the men of the lake with long swords. Panic came upon the goblins, and even as they turned to meet this new attack, the elves charged again with renewed numbers. Victory seemed at hand when a cry rang out on the heights above. Goblins had scaled the mountain from the other side, and already many were on the slopes above the gate, and others were streaming down recklessly to attack the spurs from above, and the defenders had too few to bar the way for long. Victory now vanished from hope. They had only stemmed the first onslaught of the Black Tide. Day drew on. The goblins gathered again in the valley. There a host of wargs came ravening, and with them came the bodyguard of Bolg, goblins of huge size with scimitars of steel. Now Bard was fighting to defend the eastern spur, and yet giving slowly back, and the elf lords were at bay about their king upon the southern arm, near to the watch post on Raven Hill. Suddenly there was a great shout, and from the gate came a trumpet call. They had forgotten Thorin. Out leapt the king under the mountain, and his companions followed him. They were in shining armor, and red light leapt from their eyes. Rocks were hurled down from on high by the goblins above, but they held on, leapt down to the false foot, and rushed forward to battle. Wolf and rider fell or fled before them. Thorin wielded his axe with mighty strokes, and nothing seemed to harm him. To me, to me, elves and men, to me, Oh, my kinsfolk, he cried. Down, heedless of order, rushed all the dwarves of Dane to his help. Down, too, came many of the lake men, for Bard could not restrain them. The wargs were scattered, and Thorin drove right against the bodyguard of Bolg. But he could not pierce their ranks. His numbers were too few. Soon the attackers were attacked, facing every way, hemmed all about with goblins and wolves returning to the assault. The bodyguard of Bolg came howling against them and drove in upon their ranks like waves upon cliffs of sand. The assault from the mountain was renewed with redoubled force, and upon either side men and elves were being slowly beaten down. On all this Bilbo looked with misery. It will not be long now before the goblins win the gate, and we are all slaughtered or driven down and captured. I would rather old Smog had been left with all the wretched treasure than that these vile creatures should get it and all of us come to a bad end. Misery me. I wish I was well out of it. The clouds were torn by the wind, and a red sunset slashed the west. Seeing the sudden gleam in the gloom, Bilbo looked round. He gave a great cry. He had seen a sight that made his heart leap. Dark shapes, small yet majestic against the distant glow. The eagles! The eagles! he shouted. The eagles are coming! The eagles! The eagles! Bilbo cried, dancing and waving his arms. If the elves could not see him, they could hear him. Soon they took up the cry, and it echoed across the valley. Many wandering eyes looked up, though as yet nothing could be seen except from the southern shoulders of the mountain. The eagles! cried Bilbo once more, but at that moment a stone hurtling from above smote heavily on his helm, and he fell with a crash and knew no more. When Bilbo came to, he was lying on the flat stones of Raven Hill, and no one was near. He was shaking and as chilled as stone, but his head burned with fire. I wonder what has happened. He sat up painfully. Looking into the valley, he could see no living goblins. Dwarves seemed to be busy removing the wall, but all was deadly still. Sorrow seemed to be in the air. Victory after all, I suppose, he said, feeling his aching head. Well, it seems a very gloomy business. Suddenly he was aware of a man climbing up and coming towards him. 
Hello there, he called with a shaky voice. What news? What voice is it that speaks among the stones? said the man. Then Bilbo remembered the ring. Well, I'm blessed, said he. This invisibility has its drawbacks after all. It's me, Bilbo Baggins, companion of Thorin, he cried, hurriedly taking off the ring. It is well that I have found you, said the man. You would have been numbered among the dead, who are many, if Gandalf had not said that your voice was last heard in this place. Are you much hurt? Oh, a nasty knock on the head, I think, said Bilbo. I feel sick and my legs are like straws. I will carry you down to the camp in the valley. The man was swift and sure-footed. It was not long before Bilbo was set down before a tent in Dale, and there stood Gandalf, with his arm in a sling. Baggins, he exclaimed. Well, I never. Alive after all. I am glad. A terrible business, and it nearly was disastrous. But other news can wait. Come, he said more gravely. You are called for, and leading the hobbit, took him within the tent. Hail Thorin, he said as he entered. I have brought him. There indeed lay Thorin Oakenshield, wounded with many wounds, and his rent armor and notched axe were cast upon the floor. He looked up as Bilbo came beside him. Farewell, good thief. He said, I go now to the halls of waiting to sit beside my fathers until the world is renewed. Since I leave now all gold and silver and go where it is of little worth, I wish to part in friendship from you, and I would take back my words and deeds at the gate. Bilbo knelt on one knee filled with sorrow. Farewell, King Under the Mountain. This is a bitter adventure, if it must end so, and not a mountain of gold can amend it. Yet I am glad that I have shared in your perils. That has been more than any Baggins deserves. No, said Thorin. There is more in you of good than you know, child of the kindly West. If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. But sad or merry, I must leave it now. Farewell. Then Bilbo turned away, and he went by himself, and sat alone wrapped in a blanket, and he wept until his eyes were red and his voice was hoarse. A mercy it is. He said at last to himself, that I woke up when I did. I wish Thorin were living, but I am glad that we parted in kindness. You are a fool, Bilbo Baggins, and you made a great mess of that business with a stone. And there was a battle, in spite of all your efforts to buy peace and quiet. But I suppose you can hardly be blamed for that. All that had happened after he was stunned, Bilbo learned from Gandalf. The eagles had long had suspicion of the goblins mustering, so they too had gathered in great numbers under the great eagle of the misty mountains, and at length, smelling battle from afar, they had come speeding down the gale in the nick of time. They it was who dislodged the goblins from the mountain slopes, casting them over precipices or driving them down shrieking and bewildered among their foes. But even with the eagles they were still outnumbered, in that last hour, Bjorn himself had appeared. No one knew how or from where. He came alone and in bear's shape, and he seemed to have grown almost a giant size in his wrath. The roar of his voice was like drums and guns, and he tossed wolves and goblins from his path like straws and feathers. He fell upon their rear and broke like a clap of thunder through the ring and lifted Thorin, who had fallen pierced with spears, and bore him out of the fray. Swiftly he returned, and his wrath was redoubled, so that nothing could withstand him, and no weapon seemed to bite upon him. He scattered the bodyguard and pulled down Bolg himself and crushed him. The goblins fled in all directions. 
Victory had been assured before the fall of night, but the pursuit was still on foot when Bilbo returned to the camp, and not many were in the valley, save the more grievously wounded. They buried Thorin deep beneath the mountain, and Bard laid the Arkenstone upon his breast. There let it lie till the mountain falls, he said. May it bring good fortune to all his folk that dwell here after. Upon his tomb, the elven king then laid Orchrist, the elvish sword that had been taken from Thorin in captivity. It is said in songs that it gleamed ever in the dark if foes approached, and the fortress of the dwarves could not be taken by surprise. A fourteenth share of all the silver and gold, wrought and unwrought, was given up to Bard. For Dane said, We will honour the agreement of the dead, and he has now the Arkenstone in his keeping. Even a fourteenth share was wealth exceedingly great, greater than that of many mortal kings. From that treasure, Bard sent much gold to the master of Lake Town, and he rewarded his followers and friends freely. To the elven king he gave the emeralds of Giriam, such jewels as he loved most, which Dane had restored to him. To Bilbo he said, This treasure is as much yours as it is mine. I should wish that the words of Thorin, of which he repented, should not prove true, that we should give you little. I would reward you most richly of all. Uh, very kind of you, said Bilbo, but how on earth should I get all that treasure home without war and murder all along the way? In the end, he would take only two small chests, one filled with silver and the other with gold, such as one strong pony could carry. That will be quite as much as I can manage, said he. He went at last to say goodbye to his friends. Farewell, Balin, he said, and farewell, Dwalin, and farewell, Dory, Nori, Ori, Owen, Glowin, Bifer, Bofer, and Bomber. May your beards never grow thin. And turning towards the mountain, he added, Farewell, Thorin Oakenshield, and Feely, and Keely. May your memory never fade. The dwarves bowed low before their gate, but words stuck in their throats. Goodbye and uh, good luck, wherever you fare, said Balin at last. If ever you visit us again, when our halls are made fair once more, then the feast shall indeed be splendid. If ever you are passing my way, said Bilbo, don't wait to knock. Tea is at four, but any of you are welcome at any time. Then he turned away. The elf host was on the march, and if it was sadly lessened, yet many were glad. For now the northern world would be merrier for many a long day. The dragon was dead, the goblins overthrown, and their hearts looked forward after winter to a spring of joy. Gandalf and Bilbo rode behind the elven king, and beside them strode Bjorn, once again in man's shape, and he laughed and sang in a loud voice upon the road. So they went on until they drew near to the borders of Mirkwood. Farewell. O oh, elven king, said Gandalf, merry be the greenwood while the world is yet young, and merry be all your folk. Farewell, Gandalf, said the king. May you ever appear where you are most needed and least expected. The oftener you appear in my halls, the better I shall be pleased. I beg of you, said Bilbo, stammering and standing on one foot, to accept this gift and he brought out a necklace of silver and pearls that Dane had given him at their parting. "'In what way have I earned such a gift, O Hobbit?' said the king. "'Well, er, I thought, didn't you know,' said Bilbo, rather confused, "'that er, some little return should be made for your uh, hospitality. "'I mean, even a burglar has his feelings. "'I have drunk much of your wine and eaten much of your bread.' I will take your gift, O Bilbo the Magnificent, said the king gravely, and I name you elf, friend, and blessed. May your shadow never grow less, or stealing would be too easy. Farewell. Then the elves turned towards the forest, and Bilbo started on his long road home. 
By midwinter, Gandalf and Bilbo had come all the way back, along both edges of the forest, to the doors of Bjorn's house. And there for a while they both stayed. Yuletide was warm and merry there, and men came from far and wide to feast at Bjorn's bidding. When it was spring, and a fair one with mild weathers and a bright sun, Bilbo and Gandalf took their leave at last of Bjorn. So comes snow after fire, and even dragons have their ending, said Bilbo, and he turned his back on his adventure. The Turkish part was getting very tired, and the Baggins was daily getting stronger. I wish now only to be in my own armchair. As all things come to an end, even this story, a day came at last when they were in sight of the country where Bilbo had been born and bred, where the shapes of the land and of the trees were as well known to him as his hands and toes. Coming to a rise, he could see his own hill in the distance, and he stopped suddenly and said, Roads go ever, ever on, over rock and under tree, by caves where never sun has shone, by streams that never find the sea. Over snow by winter sown, and through the merry flowers of June, over grass and over stone, and under mountains in the moon. Roads go ever, ever on, under cloud and under star, yet feet that wandering have gone, turn at last to home afar. Eyes that fire and sword have seen, and horror in the halls of stone, look at last on meadows green, and trees and hills they long have known. Gandalf looked at him. My dear Bilbo, he said, something is the matter with you. You are not the hobbit that you were. They crossed the bridge and passed the mill by the river and came right back to Bilbo's own door. Ariel Natris Oris Barzi Bedhead Duchel Dementa. Yeah, I'm not so.